Hi, everyone. Good to see you all. Welcome back to Epic Chats. My name is Jennifer, and I'm the head of US development at Epic Foundation. So at Epic, we fight to change the lives of disadvantaged children and youth around the world through our portfolio of high impact organizations. I'm really excited to introduce all of you to our special guest today. But first, a little bit of housekeeping. So today's chat will include an opportunity to ask uh, Jose your burning questions during the AMA. So as you think of them, please add them to the questions tab or upvote the ones that you'd love to see answered. So with that, over to you, Pat. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you all of thanks to all of you for being with us today. So my name is Pac, and I'm based in Belgium. And by the way, today is our national day. We're really excited to welcome Jose on today's Epic Chat. Welcome also to all our pledgers who are present today. As a reminder, and also maybe an invitation to those of you who are new to Epic, the Epic Pledge is a promise to give to social good a percentage of your success as an investor or an entrepreneur. You know, Epic is all about giving back. So today, Jose has chosen to support the great Common Knit. Common Knit is a net tech nonprofit working to solve the, the educational resource disparity by supporting 22 million teachers and students. Yes, I said 22 million across 75% of all US public schools with a free digital library. And we are so proud that Common Lead COO Agnes is with us today. Hello, Agnes. So you will see a pop-up screen that will open on a separate donation page. Every donation counts, so please click and select Common Lead. I hope you, you'll enjoy today's, uh, today's chat. And back to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Pac. So Jose is joining us today from France. And I see that we have guests from LA and Paris, Belgium, Toronto. And so uh, love that we're joining from all over the world today. Um, so for the first question, uh, I actually want us to all jump on a plane to Latin America. Uh, because back when Jose was 22, um, you founded Del Mate, which is an eBay model for the Latin America market. And then you went on to launch and invest in a whole series of businesses in Europe and Latin. And so you're the first uh, Epic Chat speaker we've hosted with deep insights into Latin. And so for the founders in the room today who are really curious about the Latin market, I was hoping that you would have some advice or trends you can share with them. Absolutely. First of all, thank you very much for having me here. It's a pleasure to be able to share a little bit of our experiences and, you know, things that we've lived and hopefully it would be useful for some of the audience. We are also grateful for Epic, you know, on supporting, you know, a lot of these amazing organizations around the world. And I'm happy also to, to, to be lucky to have met some lead and be able to provide you know, some little support on the great work they are doing. So thank you for that. In any case, um, talking about Latin America, Latin America has changed a lot. When I started my first business um, in 2000, it was a completely different landscape than what you have today. Keep in mind that at that point, there was no Google. At that point, when you wanted to launch a business, you needed something around, you know, $3 million just to pay on infrastructure to be able to have the servers you know, on the hardware that you require to be able to host the websites. Now, that's something that you could do today with $50,000. So uh, at that moment, there was no venture capital in the region. The, the money that we raised uh, very luckily you know, was, was mm -hmm. equity people, which frankly are amazing, but, but they're different than venture capitalists. They don't necessarily focus on technology, um, you know, and, and it was an experiment for them to start testing the waters in the region. And, you know, we were lucky enough to raise a very significant amount of capital that helped us go through very tumultuous times. Uh, as, as I always say, Latin America, you have to be prepared 
for cycles. And when you have positive cycles, you know, things are going incredibly well. But when things dry up, then things become rough. And I think that's still the case today. Now, a lot of things have changed since. Latin America has proven that it's a big enough market for great companies of great size to be built. Mercado Libre, which was a company that my business met with, is worth today uh, over $90 billion in market capitalization. So, you know, there is clearly an opportunity to build great big businesses, but it's been a process to convince investors to trust the region and to stay there for the long term. And mm. with that, the infrastructure has also been evolving. Payment systems, logistics, and a lot of enablers that make some of the businesses, you know, in the tech space work, you know, have been maturing through the years. And I certainly feel that there's also big differences between markets. When you talk about Brazil, Brazil has been further ahead, you know, than, than a lot of the other markets before. Mexico has been catching up strongly over the course of the last three or four years. Um, and, and we start to see some of the latest players in the world, uh, you know, to, to invest and to support businesses. And we see companies in the region like Nubank or Rappi or a number of others that have been incredibly successful already, not only in raising capital, but in building you know, pretty big uh, and, 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 and fantastic profitable business. Also, so I think that we are at a point where you already have, have a bunch of entrepreneurs uh, that have been successful, that are ready to put back some of that money you know, into younger uh, and more creative and maybe more energetic founders. And also, you know, the landscape has you know, developed a lot from the perspective of having a lot of foreign investment getting comfortable you know, in making money flow to the region. And that has made a significant difference. Having said that, there is still gap. I think it is relatively easy uh, at these days to raise, you know, uh, your first very little money from friends and family. But then when you really need to start thinking about raising the first three, four, five million dollars, and you still don't necessarily have the right unit economics or the right traction, there's still challenges. Now, once you have proven the model and once you are growing, there's still a lot of money that is flowing. No? On the other side, there's also amazing talent hubs that have been emerging throughout the years. Uh, cities around great universities, arbitrage between different Latin American countries um, for, for tech has also been used. I mean, Argentina has been originally very strong on that. We start to see other markets like Colombia or Mexico emerge, you know, in, in, in bringing great technology talent. So a lot of the, 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 the ingredients that you need for entrepreneurship to work start to become more real. Now, that doesn't mean that Latin America doesn't have a lot of challenges still, because I think there is a lot of political challenges, a lot of economic and regulatory challenges, uh, you know, exchange rate challenges. Uh, there's a bunch of examples where we have invested in businesses that have done incredibly well in the local currency, but, you know, unfortunately, the currency has devaluated so much that then the net value, you know, has been not as high as it would have been, you know, just purely on a market-driven uh, situation. No? And having said that also, the, 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 the public markets start to become more and more friendly to Latin American businesses. This year only, we have had out of our portfolio five IPOs in Brazil over the course of the last 12 months. And, you know, it's very hard to say that because the world has been, you know, suffering a lot. A lot of people have been losing their jobs, you know, and not only that, losing loved ones, you know, through this very critical period that we have all lived. But, but having said that, uh, you know, there is, there is a lot of things that have happened through the last year that have uh, accelerated a number of trends in terms of penetration, in terms of how people buy, and in terms of, you know, usage of services that if we would not have had, uh, you know, the need from a lot of our population, uh, maybe it would have taken longer for them to try. Mm -hmm. so, so there's also <laughs> 
Thank you, Jose. Um, sounds like there's a, a lot of opportunities and if anyone in the room has uh, some great uh, early stage ideas with, with traction, you know who to go to. Um, and actually, uh, Common Lit is expanding in the LATAM market as we speak. And so maybe you have some advice to share with them later. With uh, pleasure. So, so there's a, a, a really unique partnership between you and, and Fabrice Grinda um, with FJ Labs. And I remember when we were speaking earlier, you said you shared a hundred investments in common before you made it official. And so I'm, I'm curious what the, the story is behind the genesis of FJ Labs. And again, in terms of advice, if there's folks in the room who are looking for their co-founder, you know, what would you say to them? Yeah, I mean, Fabrice and I have had the very big luck of knowing each other for a very long time. And, you know, frankly, starting doing things together without really thinking, you know, who's going to do what or how we're going to, uh, I'm going to take the responsibility or not. We just had time. He was running his businesses. I was running mine. And everything started in New York when, you know, when we flew in, because a bunch of friends said, hey, you have to meet this guy that is building the eBay of France. And, you know, and then uh, right after that, we ended up here, actually, where I am now, uh, close to Sophie Antipolis in, in the south of France you know, launching our business out of the servers of Fabrice at the time. You know? And that's where the story started. And, you know, then after that, uh, you know, Fabrice moved on and built another business in the U.S. And then when he finished, when, when he sold that business, we reconnected again through the building of OLX. Um, you know, and, and at that point, we said, hey, we, we both made some money. You know, we get a lot of deal flow. Why we don't start investing? I've invested in some stuff. You invested in some stuff. We kind of share, you know, very similar mindset on what type of things we like. So, you know, let's start investing. And then we started to share deals together. And then before even we realized everything was coming in place and Fabrice was doing some amazing things that are very well suited for him. And I was doing other things that are well suited for me that maybe he likes less. And, and maybe I was doing th or he was doing things that maybe I like less. So, so, so it was a very, very interesting and synergic uh, partnership, no? But, but, but it was mainly driven by trust. No, the fact that, you know, Fabrice and I could wire each other money without asking any questions. And, and, and today, obviously, much more so, you know, because we've known each other for a very long time and we've been doing business for a very long time. And that's the, the most single, the most important single advice that I could give to anyone here is, you know, when you partner with someone, try to find ways of doing things together, you know, knowing each other better. Uh, you know, and, and if you have opportunities to take on a task together, do that, because that that will give you very, very good insights into how you work, how you think and how the other person thinks and works. And all of that, you know, little by little uh, started to develop, we started to do really, really well. Uh, frankly, we never thought that we were going to be, you know, investing uh, like we do today. We were doing it more as a way of helping entrepreneurs being close to the market. And we never expected to make the type of returns that we've made. But then, then things started to go very well. And then we said, hey, we should be more structured. We, have, we should have more discipline. We should put, you know, our clear heuristics, how we are thinking. And then, you know, start to deploy more for capital. And, 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 and before we realized, you know, we, we said, okay, uh, we are doing a lot of things. So why we don't create a vehicle that let us do what we love? No, and, and that's the genesis of FJ Labs. At the end, uh, you know, we had on one side company building, which Fabrice and I continue to love. We are both real entrepreneurs and we like to build new businesses. And on the other side, we have our investing arm, you know, that, that, that is much more scalable, that allows to continue to be close to the market, to deploy more capital, and frankly, also to, 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 to learn. Because, you know, a lot of the investments that we do help us understand what the trends are in the market. No? And that's kind of the way that the story came together. And then once we, you know, as, as, as Fabrice likes to say, you know, we started throwing spaghetti into the wall. And sometimes you throw spaghetti into the wall and a lot of th things don't stick. But, you know, those things that stick, we take them, you know, and we put them together and, and, and we move forward. No? And, and, and that's what, what, what we have today. Today we have FG Labs, which, you know, is our holding company and let us do, frankly, uh, in a much more systematic way, very disciplined, very professionalized, uh, but it still let us do that. Thank you, Jose. Well, clearly the, the spaghetti has really stuck because... You've made, I think, 701 investments so far, 250 exits with a realized IR north of 40%, and 
50 of those exits are unicorns, 19 of which you got in early. And so that tracker, that track record, you know, I, I uh, challenge uh, folks out there to, to be able to go up against. And so um, it's just a real testimony to, you know, the, the synergies that you and Fabrice have, the process that you've built, um, and really the expertise that you have in uh, the, the marketplaces uh, in particular. And so I'm, I'm curious, like of all of these investments that you've made, you know, during the pandemic or maybe before the pandemic, you know, which ones were you especially proud of or optimistic about? You know, Fabrice and I, it, it's hard. It's like when you have a lot of kids, you know, it's, it's hard to say, do I like <laughs> Yes, I'm asking you to pick your favorite baby. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what, what I would say is that the vision that Fabrice and I have always had is, you know, the reason why we work in technology is because we feel that technology is a means to do good to the world. No, we feel that by, you know, by providing people with new ways and more efficient ways of doing things, you know, we are making lives of people better. And even if you think of a purely economic perspective, that is true. When you democratize access in a more efficient way for consumers, you are creating real value. And that, and that has been, frankly, the main driver, and it continues to be the main driver that we have, which is, you know, doing what we love, but, but in such a way that we feel is can have a strong impact in the world and can create, you know, positiveness. No? And, and I think that uh, going back to that, probably the companies that we are closest to are the companies that we have built. And, you know, those are the ones that are closest to the heart. Uh, even, even, even in the circumstances where we've done it already through the FJ Labs structure, no? companies where we have been more operationally involved, um, you know, and, and here we can talk about, you know, companies like OLX, companies like the Remate, uh, you know, companies like Viagenet, companies where we had, you know, a very strong role on the operational side. Um, now, on the investing side, I also have to say, uh, I'm going to give you an example. There's, you know, there's, there's a company called Tienda Nube, which is, you know, a Latin American uh, version of Shopify. And, and, you know, I, we met these guys, Fabrice and I, with Alec, which is the guy with whom, you know, Fabrice started OLX and I started the Ramate. We met them in Buenos Aires and the guys were super young and were amazing. And, and we looked at them and, and we said, listen, we don't know what Shopify is going to do, but, but clearly you are great and we want to back you and your vision is fantastic. You know, the guys closed their last round at, at a, you know, billion plus valuation, no? And, 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 you know, these type of stories, when you see entrepreneurs flourish, you know, from being very early and people that you met that, you know, that, 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 that came to us in a lot of ways to ask for advice, uh, you know, it, it makes you feel pretty proud. And, and I have to say that we have a lot of stories like that. So, you know, that, that's why we love what we do. And I love that story that you shared. Um, so... Uh, I realize that uh, we're already uh, into our AMA. Um, and so I want to pull a question from our audience um, from Magdalena. I hope I pronounce your name right. Um, so the question is, is there a shift towards sustainable investment or how do you consider your position as a change maker for startups, but also for the world? It's a great question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I think clearly uh, more and more, there is, there is more consciousness and awareness you know, on, on, on people that invest, you know, on doing things that can create good for the world. Now, I'm not saying that people have not been aware of it, but it is good that the, that the world is moving in the direction where people are becoming more aware. I also think that the younger generations are being more exposed to things, you know, that, that maybe, you know, when I was a kid, I was not exposed to. So, so, so you know, I feel that that, that push from, from amazing, uh, you know, uh, younger entrepreneurs, it's really helping, uh, you know, that consciousness to become, you know, more evident. And, and, and I think investors feel responsible, you know, in a certain way for what they do. And I think that a lot of them are taking responsibility. Now, that doesn't mean that everything that happens, you know, is impact investing or that has to have a social twist on it. But at least from our perspective, we, we, we generally like to think of, of our investments on things that can help people, you know, uh, create value in a different way, democratize access, or make things more attractive, uh, you know, f 
for, for, for them in a social way. No? So, and, and, and even though we are focused in marketplaces, when we see things that, are, that can have you know, environmental impact or that are bringing in certain twists where there can be social benefit, you know, it's clearly something that, that we see with very good eyes. And we see more and more of that. Um, and this is a, a great add-on to what you just shared from Agnes, actually. Um, so she said, clearly you know how to pick winners. What do you look for in early stage uh, companies, team, numbers? What's your special sauce? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that we have a pretty well-structured thing. We, we, when we look to companies, we analyze them pretty quickly. We, we don't lead rounds and we don't join boards. And what we try to do is you know, to try to make quick decisions. The type of things that we didn't get when we were entrepreneurs, we, liked, we wanted people to get back to us clearly, straight, you know, and, and fast. And that's something that in a lot of cases we didn't get because people were holding for the option. Ah, maybe someone else come in. I'm going to wait and I'm going to see. So from our case, we have a very well-structured process. We look, uh, you know, to a certain type of things in those businesses and we can make decisions quickly. Now, to your question, what is that? First of all, when we do an investment, we have to like the team. Now, everybody says we have to like the team. Now, what I want to say here is what does it mean for us to like the team? We like to see entrepreneurs that are hungry, you know, that, are, uh, that you can see that desire, passion in their eyes about building something that they love and that they are passionate about. So that's something that is very important. Second, we also want to have the feel that are people that, you know, have and follow a certain ethical framework and certain guidelines that that is not just because I'm going to make money, I'm going to be ready to do whatever. No, we want to make sure that there's certain guidelines that people follow. We also uh, want to make sure that entrepreneurs have a, I would say, unit economics, analytical mind. We don't like to invest on businesses, and, and that's not to say that there cannot be great businesses that have been built without that framework. But in our case, we like to look for people that think economically, and they can, th that they can come to us and say, listen, you know, this is the way I'm going to make money. This is what my cost of acquisition looks like. This is what my margins are, and this is how I'm going to pay that cost of acquisition back. Now, it doesn't mean that an entrepreneur has to come to us and say, listen, this is working today. It, it doesn't matter. It could be, you know, it's going to work in six months or in two years once we have reached scale. But just having that feel of the entrepreneur to think analytically is something that we like and value very much. No? And, and, and again, you know, their ability, and I think lastly and very importantly, their ability to communicate well and to be good leaders. Because when you're an entrepreneur, you need to sell your story not only to investors, you need to sell your story also to other people that you want to convince to come and join you and, and, and get into the boat. No, so it's super important that entrepreneurs are, you know, good in communicating and that they can, you know, be a good example and a good leader. Now, and then on top of that, there is, there is skills. No? And, and sometimes you find entrepreneurs that have amazing product skills, amazing tech skills, amazing sales skills. So, so you know, amazing marketing skills. But it's, but it's rare that, that, that you find someone that has all of that. So at the end, they have to have the ability to understand what is what they've got and how they are going to build, you know, what they are less strong on. So that's the first thing. Uh, we need to like the people. Then second, we need to like the business. And we have a set of heuristics, you know, what it means to like the business. Of course, you know, it, the, the, the business has to be in a certain... A market with a certain size, you know, we like companies that, that, that can become leaders, you know, into their space. And there's a whole bunch of other variables that we could talk about, you know, but it would take too long. But we, we do have, you know, a number of variables that we look into uh, that, that, that help us understand whether we like the business. And then lastly, we need to like the terms. We are, we are not uh, terms of conscious. And, and in a lot of cases, we have passed on things that, yeah, maybe they could be incredibly big, but we don't see a clear economic rationale into, you know, the prices, no? Uh, and, 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 you know, sometimes we've invested in things that we think is expensive, but also a lot of times we have passed on things where we feel that the price is exorbitant, even if we love the business and we love 
you know, the, the, the entrepreneurs. No, so 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 we need we also need to to like the terms, and we are not very picky on terms because at the end we don't lead. So we need to follow in terms of other things, uh, you know, to the leads. But but we do care about traction versus price, especially you know when we're doing a series A, series B, and and, and you guys can look into Fabrice's blog. He has a lot of great content around, you know, what is what we think is a reasonable price, you know, based on different variables of a marketplace, GMV, take rate, etc. I was just going to mention yeah. that. Thank the you last, for sharing. Last, yeah. The, yeah. The last, for sharing the ingredients will, for your special sauce. <laughs> and then the, the last thing I will add is, on top of that, we love things that can follow our thesis. No, and there is two things that we are focused on now, which is the verticalization of horizontal marketplaces, the migration of what we call uh, double commit uh, marketplaces to what we call marketplace peak or purely new marketplace peak models where you pretty much, uh, you know, you have the marketplace peak what the supply should be for you. And, and there's a whole bunch of dynamics that come around that. And then thirdly, we also love the migration that we are seeing into the B2B space because there's so many industries that are incredibly obsolete where we feel there can be massive disruption. So these are the four things that we like you know, to see as framework, you know, when we, when we, when we look to an investment. Great. Thank you. That was really uh, helpful. And I, and I hope that addressed at least partially your question, Jason. Um, so time like literally flies by um, when we have amazing conversations like this with uh, investors that are just, um, you know, investing in amazing companies. And so I want to end, um, I guess, full circle, bringing it back to Epic and why you chose to sit down with us today. Um, and so I, I'm curious, uh, what drew you to Epic's mission um, at the onset? And what does social impact mean to you uh, personally or, or professionally? I mean, I think that, that when you are an uh, blessed and lucky of how I was raised and what opportunities I've had through my life. I think that having been, you know, somewhat successful in, in what I've done business-wise, I, I feel the responsibility to give back. No, and I think that 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 it's very important that that we understand that, you know, when I was, you know, starting, I didn't have what I have today. And a lot of people gave me a hand. So 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 that that is for me the biggest inspiration. I, I think that for people that have been lucky and have been successful, you know, we have the responsibility to give back. Now, then from there, you think about what's the best way to give back. I mean, in the case of Epic, you know, we, we know, you know, your founder for a long time and, and, and you know, and, and we feel that, you know, that he's done a great job, you know, in, in pushing an amazing initiative, you know, where you guys are helping a lot of other entrepreneurs, you know, to, to do good into the world. And that's something that, you know, that, that we certainly love, and that's the main reason why we're sitting here, no? because at the end, uh, you know, we feel that, that you guys are doing a, a fantastic job in, in helping others, you know, wanting to give, you know, to, to, to do a good job in making the right decisions. And I think that's great. And, and, and you know, we, we are grateful that, you know, that, that we have organizations like yours, you know, that can help us think and ease out or work on how to, you know, how to try to do more good into the world. Thank you. Thank you for the vote of confidence. And again, you know, for everyone tuning in, we just really welcome you to join our movement, um, you know, where you take a stand to um, share your success with organizations that are out there helping uh, disadvantaged kids access education, you know, healthcare, employment. Um, there's a lot of need out there, uh, and these organizations have been on the ground even before the pandemic, um, and they'll be there to help rebuild afterwards. So thank you again for supporting Common Lit with this episode of Epic Chats. Um, and this is actually the last one of the summer. We'll be back in September with Fred uh, Destin, who's the who's previously the general partner at Excel and currently the founder of Stride VC. So if you enjoyed our chat today with Jose, um, we invite you to stay for another minute as we close. You'll automatically uh, see our little Super Bowl commercial uh, to tell you a little bit more about the Epic Pledge community. And we really hope you'll consider joining our community. Uh, and so thank you again and have a great summer, everyone. Um, Jose is actually uh, 
headed off to the Caribbean with his team. And so we wish him um, a wonderful trip. And also thank you again to my uh, co-host, Pac. Um, and again, happy uh, Belgian day. <laughs> thank you very much for having me, guys. It's been a pleasure. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Goodbye. And Bye. have a good trip.